Hey everyone, welcome to Impact Discipleship. We are back here again, Saturday morning, and we are beginning uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, last week we finished 1 Timothy, uh, that we have all those teachings online, and now we are going to do all 18 verses of 1 Timothy, so, um, of 2 Timothy. So um, I'd like you... Uh, well, let me, let me give you a little background. Of course, you know that Timothy is a young man. He's uh, pastoring the, uh, the church in Ephesus. He's a uh, disciple of Paul, a spiritual son of Paul. We're going to see those themes come up again throughout this letter. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's got some really great pieces. Next week when we pick it up... Uh, there's going to be some outrageous pieces that really, I think, are related to this whole aspect of this ministry we just decided uh, to do three years ago, almost three years ago, about, you guys may remember me saying, uh, you're not a disciple unless you're discipling someone to become a disciple. And uh, you're going to see that very theme in the next chapter. But I digress. So, uh, young Cyrus, why don't you go ahead and read the first seven verses. Again, this, it's, a short, it's a short chapter. It's only 18 verses. We should be able to get through it. We could, we could um, go right through it. I'd like you to guys have your Bible in hands. I'll be first assigned Timothy. some reading. Second, Kim, Sem, Second Timothy, first seven verses of chapter one. All right. This is... Paul, an apostle of... Yeshua by the will of Yahweh in keeping with the promise of life that is in Yeshua. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as <coughs> night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you, oh, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Wow, that's interesting. What version is that? The, the British. NIV. Oh, the British NIV? All right. The British NIV. Yeah, that's a good version. Um, okay, so we're going to just handle these as we go. The first couple of verses, I love how he says, uh, I'm an apostle by his will. It's very easy to bypass these, these little phrases because they don't seem so theological. But, you know, we have to recall that Paul had no interest in believing in Yeshua uh, as the promised Jewish Messiah. He, he, quite the contrary, right? He was persecuting anybody uh, who was a believer. He was on a mission to destroy those that were calling themselves Christians or so. Uh, and then he had this radical encounter on the road to Damascus. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 9. We're not going to go there today. But, you know, that's the testimony of what happens to him. So he's acknowledging it's, that, it's, it's, it's by God's will alone that Paul was chosen, and he knows that. Even though he's uh, very involved now in, in the church, he still remembers, hey, this wasn't my option. I, I was chosen by God. He goes on to um, talk about this promise of life. Of course, we could, we could say, you know, what does that have to do with? What, is, it, is it the life of uh, we have here on earth? Um, but I think he's really talking about, in this case, um, the true life that begins when you, when you die to yourself, even, even on earth, right? That when we're, we die to this person and we're born again. And you're going to see some very, there's, there's a couple of things that, you know, I guess it can become kind of almost comical that I want to refer to Romans all the time. But there's a couple of places we're going to go back, back to multiple times today in this first chapter. Uh, one of them, of course, is Romans because Romans is the theological expansion of many of the points he makes in other letters. So it's like, you may not get all the details when he makes a statement or in a letter, but you go to Romans and you can find the expanse of those details. The other place we'll see lots of today 
is actually the letter to the Ephesians. I want you to think in your mind how re related these are because it's Timothy who's in Ephesus pastoring the, pastoring the church. So it's, uh, it's Timothy, you get this? So it's Timothy who's in Ephesus and when you read the letter to the Ephesians, you see a lot of the, uh, the themes, okay? So he says in this idea of the promise of life that comes when you're born again, I want you to think of the expansion of that in the book of Romans in chapter 6 when he says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, remember what I just said, True life as a believer begins when there's a death, right? For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's, if you go back to these words in this one verse, the promise of life, the promise of life, that, that, that phrase is what he's expanding on here in the, in the book of Romans. All of this idea that we die, Romans chapter 6, uh, 5 to 11. So, so you, you see this promise of life being expanded on. How do you get this promise of life? Oh, we first... We first conform to his death. Then we conform to the resurrection. Then we live as this new, this new person, this new creature. He goes on to say in Romans, death no longer has dominion over, over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he now lives, he lives to God. You can see this amazing contrast in concepts. Think about what he's writing again to Timothy. He's calling this the promise of life. You don't have the promise of life as a believer without conforming to the death. And, and it's not just Romans. You can read in Philippians, he says these things. It's a theme through his whole writings because Paul is the champion of what we call today Christian theology. He's the one formulating these ideas and saying, hey, this is what this actually means. It's not just, oh, we got a Savior, his name is Yeshua. It's like, wow, something happens to you, right? Then he uses this phrase, uh, we might say, hey, I'm talking to you. Romans chapter 6. Likewise, you also. Hey, I'm talking to you. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Right. So that, that's that promise of life. And then he says about this thing, what comes from the Father are these three things. He calls them grace, mercy, and and peace, right? Um, oh, what comes from the Father and the Son. Grace is the supernatural empowerment of God. And that, that's an expansive concept in this letter, even in this chapter. Mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is compassion or forgiveness and release, releasing somebody in place of punishment. Here's the, here's the real key. And you have to be the one that holds the power to do the punishment. Meaning, me offering you mercy for something you did to someone else is not the same as the person you did it to offering you mercy. Meaning, they have the right to hold the offense. They have the right, maybe even the authority to punish. And they release you. That's mercy. Right? That's what God does for us. So that's, an, that's a really important idea. And then peace. What is peace? That's like a supernatural internal joy or contentment that's detached and often despite external conditions that would otherwise indicate you should not feel peace, right? That's real peace. It's not like, oh, I feel really peaceful because things are peaceful. No, real peace is you feel peace even if things aren't peaceful. It's an internal contentment that exists absent attachment to what's going on around you. That's a powerful thing he's saying. Hey, what comes from the Father and Son? We could stop right here. Grace, supernatural power from God. Mercy, complete forgiveness uh, from the person who has the right to punish us. Peace, I'm content no matter what. 
Wow, what, a, what an introduction that he gives us, right, in the, first, in the first two verses, right? A couple of keys in the next few verses is a phrase he says, pure conscience, mindful of tears, genuine faith that is in you. Those three concepts I want to pick up in the next few verses, uh, verses 3, 4, and 5. What is a pure conscience? I want you to think of this. This is a conscience that is free from any internal hindrances that would convict you about being inauthentic. So I want you to think of it this way. When you're alone with yourself, God knows what's going on inside your, your being, right? When you show something on the outside that's inauthentic, meaning it's not really who you are on the inside, it's not a true representation on the inside or what's really happening on the inside, that's pretense, that's like a lie. A pure conscience would never allow that to happen. So he's coming across, meaning he might as well be saying to this to me, everything you see, Timothy, I'm coming to you in purity. There's no pretense in me. I'm exactly what you see. Everything that really happened to me happened. Everything that I'm living is exactly what I believe. That's the place he's coming from. And then he shows something that is, is very powerful. As a, as a leader, he says, Timothy, I'm mindful of your tears. I don't know what the circumstance is. He doesn't elaborate on what Timothy's going through. But we know by his words, Timothy's going through something. It's very likely related to the fact that this young man is operating a congregation in a large international city, a, a, a mecca of trade that's very pagan. And he's a young man, and uh, he's dealing with Jews and Gentiles and so on and so forth. And, you know, that can't be an easy road, right? That's got to be a hard thing. So he says, he says, I'm mindful of your tears. In our modern vernacular, we might use the term empathy. Right? Now, I want to clarify what empathy is. Empathy isn't like, they're there, they're there, it'll all be okay. That's not empathy. Em empathy isn't you rushing to rescue someone, either. Empathy is being sensitive to someone's suffering without the necessary desire or intention or purpose to palliate that suffering. Meaning, it's not your job to get rid of somebody's suffering. It's your job to support them through their suffering so they can discover the message from God that's in their suffering, right? Very often, if we think rescuing somebody from their suffering is empathetic, it's not. That, that's enabling. And what you want God to do, what you're hoping God will do, is reveal where the suffering's coming from because there's always a more glorious thing after the suffering. Huh? No, better, no better words than Paul, Romans 8.18, 8, right, Cyrus? For I consider the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. That is, you know, and there's multiple places. We can, we can expand on this, but we won't. But just get the idea that uh, Paul, when he says, I'm mindful of your tears, he's not saying, there, there, let me rescue you, Timothy. He's saying, oh, God's doing a great work in you. I acknowledge that it hurts. Um, I'm here to support you. That's really what he's saying, right? Then he uses this phrase about genuine faith. He's fully persuaded. Now, I hope he is. He's the one that assigned Timothy this role. Uh, he's fully persuaded that Timothy's faith is authentic, um, that he's really a true convert. It's not conjured up. This might smack a lot of what, what you see in the world today of Christians. It's not some type of motivational self-help rhetoric. The real true faith that, 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 that in, is infused into a believer is a gift from God. It can't be conjured up outside of a gift from God. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, uh, Peter, I mean, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter writes, uh, Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a like precious faith as ours, and then, it, then he tells us how to get it, by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. See, real faith that, that seeds your belief, that makes you become 
a Christian, is a gift from God. It can't be conjured up. There's no smoke and lights and mirrors and fancy music. There's no motivational talk that can make it happen. It can only happen through a connection with God and only happens because of God. He says in Romans, back to Romans in chapter 12, Paul says, I say through the grace given to me, there's that word again, supernatural empowerment of God, to everyone who is among you to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Why? Because this gift you have, it's a gift. It's like if your daddy gave you a Mercedes Benz and you're trotting around with a bunch of your friends and acting like you did something to get it. It's like, no, your daddy bought you that car, right? He's saying, daddy gave you that faith. This is what Paul says, but th to think more soberly, as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. It's a gift, right? Now, this is where it really takes a turn because, because as we always see, there's always, right, the, the, the gospel is two sides, always, right? The good news is the gift of faith brings eternal salvation. The other side of the coin is what are you going to do with it? Now what? What's your role? So, you know, in, in English we say, therefore, right, chapter 1, verse 6, therefore, hey guy, leader that I left in Ephesus, let me remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, that I laid hands on you. Right? He says that. And then he says, and, and, and this might hint to what, we don't know for sure, might hint to what Timothy's suffering with, that he's mindful of his tears. And then he says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear. Hey, if you were a 20-year-old guy or 22, however old Timothy is, and you're left behind to manage an entire city church in a, in a pagan place, in a new faith, pretty frightening, right? Maybe it's fear. He says, Timothy, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, right? So let's talk about the gift, um, the commissioning or anointing, the laying on of hands. It's not just the physical laying on of hands. It's the acknowledgement. I send you. I commission you. I, I'm passing authority onto you. That's a Hebraic thing, right? A father would take his son before he died and, and prophesy over him. He'd touch his head. And he'd, and he'd say, now this. Timothy is a spiritual son. Paul laid hands on him, commissioned him, sent him. And um, he says, this, ga this gift of faith must be cultivated. You can't just live on the juice of what you were sent with, right? So, so, and you've been specifically created for something. You have a calling. Like in this case, you've got to believe he has a pastoral calling because he's left behind to pastor a church, right? Um, you, you know, so Timothy, you have a unique calling. All you guys sitting at this table today, you have a unique calling. It all starts with faith, but it needs to be further inspired about how the Holy Spirit is acting in you and nurturing um, you and how others are nurturing you, right? And so if we were to... Hey, who's up next? Um, Isaiah, if you would turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, I want, I want you to see something because... And again, make the connection here, right? Like, bridge the gap. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. So he's writing a letter to the pastor of the church. He also writes a famous letter to Ephesus. It's called the letter to Ephesians, right? So it's not surprising that this common themes or expansion of ideas going back between, and forth between these letters, right? So... Um, if you would just read Isaiah, just uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. I want you to see this idea about this stirring up the gift that was given you. Hey, the gift came from God. Do something with it, right? So I want you to hear that theme in these few verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift. It is the gift of God. You that see how it, that's what we just said, right? Okay. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should talk in them. Walk in them. Walk in them. You see, you see that theme right there? It's like, hey, by the way, you were saved with a gift. Therefore, walk in that gift because you're a special, if you look at this word workmanship, in, in the Greek, it's, I think it's poema, which means artwork. Can you imagine there's God saying, you are God's artwork created for a specific good work before the foundations of everything. So you should walk in that work, right? So that's a general rule for us as believers. That's kind of what he's saying to, that is what he's saying to Timothy, right? Now, let's go to no fear, but rather power, love, and a sound mind. We know it's best said. I don't, I don't think I can even expand on this any better than a simple uh, two verses in 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So, so Timothy, listen, check the fear at the door. It's not part of your ministry. What is part of your ministry? Uh, power. Now, we all want this, right? Uh, and, and, and I don't think it's, it, and again, we're, we're going to refer often to the letter to the Ephesians. I don't think there's a better understanding, expanded understanding of power than in Ephesians chapter 1, where it basically says, you have within you the power that raised Christ from the grave. Now, if you could just camp out of that in your mind and realize, uh, hey, I'm running this church. I'm a young man. I'm in my 20s. I have this immense responsibility, and it's a little bit daunting, but I have the power in me that raised Christ from the grave. I think the concerns, if you really understood that, go right out the door, right? Paul, writing to the Ephesians, I'll paraphrase, you can write down in your notes, first, uh, Ephesians 1, 16 to 20. He basically says, listen, I, I keep praying for you guys. Uh, I, don't, I don't even stop praying. I'm praying consistently that you would get a spirit of wisdom and revelation. This understanding can't come by intellect. Oh, hey, guys, you got the power that raised Christ from the grave. Oh, that's cool. Let's go do some parlor tricks, right? Like, that's not what he's saying. He's like, you want to get a deep revelation inside your DNA about this. <clears throat> um, what is, fast forward, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, <coughs> which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand, in heavenly places. Wow. That's what you have available to you. Now, I want to ask you in your own mind, and we're going to come back to this in our discussion points later, what will you do with this resurrection power? See, as a non-believer, you have no option. As a believer, option one, we'll call it an option one, and we're going to see how hopefully you have no option. You go from no option to no option. But we do know in reality, you can take this power and be a new man, a new creature, right? No better, no better words than if we go back again to Romans chapter 6 that we just said. Think about what it said again. We've been united in the likeness of his death. We shall be renewed in the likeness of the resurrection. The old man was crucified. There it is. You have a death. Now, in order for you to live again, there needs to be a resurrection, right? So you see the resurrection power. You see it in, you see it in action. Hey, guys, you have the power that raised Christ from the dead in you. Romans, you were resurrected. You have the likeness of his resurrection in you. You see the connection. He's saying the same energy that had to raise Christ from the dead is the energy that resurrected you as a new man. Okay, we have that. Goes on to say, now if we died with Christ, we believe we'll live with him again. 
Again, the phrase we used earlier, likewise. This is not just the theory to the Romans. You, you reckon yourself to, for this having had, this having happened to you. That's what he's saying. Now you also have another option. Take that same resurrection power and let sin reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey its lusts. This continues in Romans 6, verses 12 and 13. So he says, don't let that happen. Don't, don't present your members as instrument of righteousness. Um, but be, but um, as being alive from the dead, right? Like, it's like, wait a minute. What exactly, here's the question. What exactly are you taking the resurrection power of Christ and using it for? You have the freedom. Resurrect a new man or resurrect the old man. You have that. If you want to continue this theme, we won't today, but just go into the rest of this section. It carries over into Romans 7, midway through Romans 7. He's like, hey, why do I keep doing what I'm not supposed to do? Where's that coming from? Oh, it's because I, 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 I'm exercising an option that I shouldn't be exercising. I'm doing the wrong thing, right? And then, of course, so we have, uh, we have power, resurrection power, love. God is love, and you've been given the Spirit of God, which means you have access to His divine nature. So, Timothy, don't be afraid. You have resurrection power. You have the nature of God in you, right? God is love, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. And, and as it says in 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, His divine power, there it is a great, again, grace, has given us everything we need for godly living, that through these you may be partakers in the divine nature, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, it says, we have the mind of Christ. So here, here it is. You have resurrection power. You have the nature of God in you, which means you have the mind of God in you. And he, and he further expands on this idea that because you have access to the divine nature and the divine mind or the mind of Christ, you have a choice to take your prior gift and do something with it. Now here is, here's the flip side. When you were not redeemed, not a born again person, the only spirit you had access to was the spirit of man. Meaning every filter, every interaction you had with the world, there was only the spirit of man in that filter. Now that you have access to the divine nature, you also can filter your entire life through the mind of Christ. There's your options. What God doesn't do is he doesn't remove your choice. He actually leaves the choice present. As the unbeliever, you're already destined. You, have, you can't choose spirit. You can't choose divine nature. But as a believer, you now can choose divine nature or go back to spirit of man, right? No better place, no better place than 1 Corinthians 2 to see that. Listen to this, what it says in verses 11, verse 11 on. For what man knows the things of man except for the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. You see that dichotomy? A man knows the Spirit of a man. God knows the Spirit of God. Pretty simple. Now we, he's talking about the redeemed person, have received not the Spirit of the world, the Spirit of man, but the Spirit who is from God. So now this you redeemed person, you didn't get born again just to experience the Spirit of man again. You got born again so you could experience the Spirit of God. That we might know the things which were freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things to spiritual. 
but the natural man does not receive the Spirit of God. For to him they are foolishness, nor can he know them, because they're only spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is not rightly judged. For who has known the mind of Christ, God that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. You see what, what this dichotomy is? And that's where you have to, that's where the launch pad is to your entire life as a believer. You have to decide whether or not you want to go back to the spirit of man or stay, stay in the divine nature. There's your, there's your world, right? All right, let's, uh, let's continue. We're going we're gonna to fast forward now and uh, we're going to go on to back to 2 Timothy. And uh, Shiloh, you're going to be 2 Timothy chapter 1 and read verses 8 to 12. Read verses 8 to 12, please. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me. He is prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us all and calls us a holy life. Not because anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been reve revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and the immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, a, yeah, and an apostle and a teacher. This is why I am suffering as I am, Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he will, he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day. So this is not going to take as long to, to power through, because you can see the common themes continue, right? He starts saying, hey, uh, I'm sharing in sufferings, um, uh, he talks again about power, talks again about the calling, talks again about how the calling didn't come from your own doing, right? Let's, if we reiterate again about the sufferings, you know, we could go back to Romans 8.18 and say, you know, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. Paul gets this. He's not concerned about his suffering because he knows it's a temporary thing and what's coming of it is worth it. Again, in Ephesians 1, we already discussed the power is the power that raised Christ from the grave. That's in you. We already discussed calling and purpose being not of your works. We saw that in Ephesians 2. We are his workmanship created for good works. So we're, we're his piece of artwork. He painted the canvas of our lives, right? So that's, that brings us through the, you know, a quick, uh, a quick um, piece of uh, verses 8 and 9. But as we go on to 10 and 11, um, we see this phrase, like, what is being revealed? What's being revealed in this, this entire thing is this idea that he has abolished death and brought life. Two big things. The two big reasons for what's being revealed. I've abolished death and brought life, and he mentions this appointment. I think Shiloh read a version that called it a herald, an apostle and a preacher. Many versions will say preacher, apostle, and teacher. So, um, so let's talk about the abolished death. NIV says a herald. Okay, so abolish death. The power of death has given way to new life. If you, were, if you read in 1 Corinthians 15 and 55, it says this. Now this is like, if you're, if you're trying to encourage someone like in a world that's chaotic around you or coming against you, like you happen to be planting a, a church in a pagan city 
where all they know is about is worshiping pagan gods. And you understood this concept. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Meaning, death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, for most people, death is one of the top worries in their life. It's one of the top fears. If Timothy is fearful, and Paul is saying, by the way, there's nothing to be more afraid of than death, and that's already been swallowed up in victory. That's the point he's making. He's abolished death, and it's given way to life. Can you imagine, if you guys would just focus here for a second, if you would live the rest of your life with no fear, but just reckless abandon for God, because, because every potential bad outcome has already been swallowed up. And that all you have to do is focus on what you have to do for God. Then he turns and says, this was mine. Right? Probably the, the most concentrated place you could find the overarching categories of what the church does. Again, is Ephesians. Same letter. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. He talks about the offices in the church. Everyone has something in this in their life. Right? You don't have to be employed by a church or be in ministry. We all have something. You may have one of these or more of these. This is what they're called. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Purpose, equip the body, the saints, for ministry. Build up the body until it looks just like Christ. Until it comes to the full image of Christ. The purpose of these five offices and all their subcategories is so that the body of Christ itself would be edified to the point where it's reflecting the image of Christ himself. Okay? In this chapter of Timothy, Paul identifies himself, really, we could safely say, as, as having three of these offices himself. He doesn't call himself a pastor, right? And he doesn't call himself a prophet. But he does call himself a preacher, which is very likely the concept of evangelist. He's a herald. He's spreading the good news, right? He's sharing the good news of salvation. He does call himself an apostle. An apostle is like a super pastor in a sense. He's a leader of leaders. He's laying down new roads into church governance, into new territories. He's expanding. He's like an imperialist. He's expanding territories, right? That's an apostle. And he's a, and he's a, te he's a teacher, which is also one of the gifts of Timothy. We know Timothy's a pastor because he's left behind to pastor. But he's also a teacher because teaching is all about good doctrine, bringing good doctrine. Paul is a preacher or an evangelist, an apostle, and a teacher. He's labeling himself. These are, my, these are my gifts. And then he says about Timothy, for this reason, I'm persuaded because I've been called to do this. I'm persuaded that what I've been called to do is going to get finished. I would like you to all think about if you knew you couldn't fail. If you knew that all you had to do is do what God called you to do and it's a guaranteed success. You'd live, you'd live such a life of joy because everything you engaged in, you'd be like, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if I'm suffering. It doesn't matter if I have a hardship. It doesn't matter if it looks bad right now. I know and persuaded that God is going to do what he claimed. I love how he says it in Philippians. Being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus or until the day of Christ Jesus. All right, listen, guys, I just want you to live with a guarantee that what God is doing you will happen. 100%, thus saith the Lord. Zero risk, you should have no fear, right? Of course, Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. And, and 
And Paul says in Timothy, I'm not ashamed of the suffering. It says in, in, in Hebrews, he despised the shame. He disregarded the shame. He didn't care that he was going to be hung naked on a cross because he knew the work that would be done was going to complete what he was set out to finish. He didn't care. It was a reckless, a reckless life towards the calling in his life. Man, there's no better way to live. So let's turn our attention to the last few verses. Josh, if you would read verses 13 to 18. And this is going to only take us a few more minutes after this because most of the heavy lifting is done. What well, you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagilius and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of one Sephorus, because he, uh, he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. So he ends this section. Of course, you know, this is just a letter, so it would, it's going to continue. But there's a couple of pieces that I want to pull out here. Um, he says, hold fast to the patterns of sound doctrine. That's a big piece. Um, that these things were committed to you via the, via the Holy Spirit, and they're, they're going to be maintained by your relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? He also says, by the way, some have turned away. Paul's talking about his own rejection. He's traveling around as an apostle, and some have turned their backs on him. They've actually, they've actually betrayed him. They're traitors. He's bringing that up. But when we use the, the phrase sound words, you know, we could stop in, verse, uh, in, in this verse, um, in verse 13, and we could create a whole sermon on it, right? As a matter of fact, multiple times we emphasize this through the entire first letter of 1 Timothy, right? As a matter of fact, and we won't do that, go back and watch those teachings, they're on the website, but every one of them points towards this one reason he wrote the first letter in the, in the first place, and that's in the third verse of the first letter. He says, I urge you when I went to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus. Here's the charge. This is like you might think, this is that moment when he laid hands on Timothy, he said, listen, stay in Ephesus. Why? That, that charge some to teach no other doctrine. Fix the problems in bad doctrine and teach good doctrine. That's this idea of sound words. That's his teaching ministry. That's also one of Paul's ministries, right? That, as we just discussed. So this entire reason he's left behind is, hey, establish good doctrine. That's why even the letter to the Ephesians is so theologically rich. It's a rich letter with lots of important theological points, right? And then uh, we'll, we'll close this idea with one theme. We're not going to talk about the traitors. I'm not going to spend time on that. I really want to focus on one last positive thing. As he mentions, Winisiphorus. Winisiphorus. And he talks about how, how he was refreshed by him. And this is a wonderful concept. This happens to be one that's near and dear to my personal heart. Uh, because it's about hospitality and ministering to the needs of others, right? He's basically saying, listen, we're charged to take care of one another, offering quarter and refuge for our brothers in the faith and, our, our, and the fellow saints, right? And he's complimenting this guy because, you know, Paul's out on the road struggling, sometimes getting beaten, sometimes getting rejected, sometimes hungry, sometimes, you know, his life at risk. And it's really refreshing when somebody comes along and takes you in and feeds you and clothes you, gives you some cash and sends you on your way, right? Like he's really appreciating that that happened. And uh, if I could point to three quick verses, uh, 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10, it's pretty simple. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received the gift, minister it to one another and be good stewards of the manifest or the manifold grace of God. In other words, it ain't yours. Give it away. Uh, take care of one another. 
be stewards of the power of God that's in you. Be a good steward of what God has given you, right? Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, of course, Romans again, chapter 12. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Honoring, giving preference to one another. Don't lag in diligence. Be fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord. How is he saying serve the Lord? When your brother's in need, fulfill the need. Right? Distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality. See, that Paul really appreciates that. He knows a life of ministry is tough. He knows that you need others to do the job you're doing, right? And, um, and then one, one more spiritual point, a little bonus point about hospitality, hospitality, is the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, the first few verses says, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Sometimes you're doing good, you, you, you even might have seen this in your thing, you do something, you give some cash to some beggar on, you know, at, at the window of your car, and then you look in, and they're gone, you're like, where did that person go? Like, they disappear. Anyway, um, so that's like, that's a little, a little bonus, right? So you could see, um, you know, Paul really appreciates the life of ministry, and he knows it's not easy, but he also knows that what, what he's... What God started, he's certainly going to complete, and he's encouraging Timothy to stand fast in those things. All right, we'll tie it up there. Um, next week, we're going to try, we're going to endeavor to really race through, uh, well, my, the next teaching. It may not be next week, because next Friday is Passover. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, it's 26 verses. Uh, it's really only two main sections, so we might be able to power through that many verses in one teaching. Uh, I'm going to really enjoy this one. The title of that teaching is called Disciples Making Disciples. It's like a really near and dear topic to my heart. So we'll pick it up next time in 2 Timothy chapter 2. See you all then.